Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. The word intelligence in English has two increasingly divergent meanings. An unrestrained capacity for learning, which is supposed to bring humanity freedom and empowerment, and secretive info-gathering whose ultimate goal is to command and control. What kind of intelligence will shape our future and how can science enable both digital freedom and digital tyranny? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by Mitchell Kaku, world-renowned physicist and popularizer of science. Mr. Kaku, this is a great honor for me. You and many other visionaries have long spoken about uh, the internet becoming the new equalizer, connecting the world, uh, bringing equality, intellectual equality to humanity. And I think uh, many of that can uh, really see that happening around uh, around us in our daily life. We can communicate people from other parts of the world. We can do business. We can get education. And until a couple of weeks ago, I think many of us thought that we were protected by our own privacy settings. But with this recent intelligence scandal, uh, well, some have doubts about that. I wonder if uh, you would agree that the more knowledge humanity acquires, the more intelligence and snooping it produces. I think every revolution has winners and losers. Take a look at the winners. Take a look at the life of our grandparents in 1900. Long distance communication in 1900 was yelling out the window. High speed travel was getting stuck in the mud with your wagon. People only lived to be the age of 49 in the year 1900. And who are the losers in this great revolution called the information revolution? Dictatorships. Dictatorships fear the internet. Because with the internet, people realize that, hey, I don't have to live like this anymore. I don't have to be poor. I don't have to keep my mouth shut. Look at what other people are doing. But there's a downside. Not big brother, but little brother. That is nosy busybodies, scam artists, and governments which try to gain access to your personal files. Every revolution has its downside. But are they really little brothers? Because the extent of uh, spying that is now going on in the Western world is not really uh, so small. I mean, it could be argued that um, you know, your own personal data, your own personal emails, your own personal communication is being monitored. And this is not a small deal, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned. But you see, it's not big brother. The internet is unstoppable. People, of course, will try to use the internet to snoop on others, but you cannot stop the march of the internet. Ideas are being spread independent of governments. Now, look at what the governments are doing. <clears throat> There's so much data out there. They simply look at the, the total amount of money you pay for a bill, look for certain targeted telephone numbers, and that's about it. There's simply too much raw data out there for any government to read all your love letters and to read everything that you've written. Now, this uh, cast of people uh, who have greater access to technology, science, information, is not just limited to scientists. I think uh, it applies mostly to governments uh, around the world. And um, I know that you've been a very strong advocate of democracy. And, uh, to these, uh, and I would like to play something that um, you said during one of your previous speeches. And I think we heard something similar at this conference as well. Um, you speaking about democracy. In history, no two democracies war with each other. Because in a democracy, people want to have a good life. They want to have a family. They want to send their kids to a good school. They want to have enough to eat. They don't want to send their children to die for the king or die for the queen. Now, um, forgive me for saying that. Uh, I don't mean to offend you, but I think you sound a lot like George W. Bush, who also used to say that democracies don't war with each other. But the problem, of course, is that democracies launch wars against non-democracies. And they do send their sons and daughters, usually less educated, less privileged sons and daughters, uh, to fight in those wars, not for the king, but for the government. And my question to you, do you think the, the level of political understanding uh, has really uh, been able to catch up with the development of science? Because obviously, many of those wars are facilitated by science and technology. Let me be clear. Even in the future, with more democratic nations, we will still have wars. People have self-interest. They have strategic interests, domestic resource interests, and so what have you. However, 
The question is, whose interests are we talking about? The interests of the king or queen? They don't care about public opinion. They don't take polls. They just go and wage wars. Now, with a democracy, it's much more difficult. You have this raging debate in the newspapers. You see mothers coming on TV crying about their child that died in the last war. To go to war for a democracy takes a lot of work. But that all is a good thing. Because once a democracy decides to go to war, it's full blast. But you have the it... will of the people behind it. Now, uh, let me ask you one more question about uh, democracy and technology. And I think the, the two have actually something in common in a sense that they create this artificial sense of agency. And take my iPad, for example. Like, I, it gives me the impression of control. I, I think I can use whatever I want with it. But the problem is, of course, that, you know, I cannot change the operating system. I can only download the applications that have already been created for me. And I think uh, democracy is a bit similar in that regard, that people believe that they have all the controls at their disposal, but some of those controls seem to be artificial. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that this, uh, both democracy and technology can numb your sense of agency. Let me ask you a question. Name a better system that has withstood the, 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 the long period of time that has given people prosperity, given people peace. Give me the name of another Mr. That Kago, is I'm not arguing against democracy. I'm arguing against the appearance of democracy, which I think exists in There's many no of the Western countries. There's no such thing as a perfect democracy. The Greeks did not have a perfect democracy. They had slaves, for God's sake, when democracy was first created. Well, I think it's a, it's a very American argument, but uh, for many people... I think people, it's not American. It is the argument. Well, I, I don't want to get into an argument with you, but I, I think it is problematic for many people. But that's what in... democracy is all about. Democracy is about sharpening two points of view and let the best argument win, rather than saying, I'm the king, off with your head. But OK, let me sharpen my point. Uh, George W. Bush was a democratically elected president. Obviously, as you said, he had some consultations about that war, but that war was launched under a false pretext. The democratic procedure that exists there in the United States, consultations with the Congress, because the Congress wasn't consulted back then, so the, the democratic procedure wasn't really explored. I think what People you're saying People didn't have a chance to actually First of deliver all, the their very judgment. The fact that you can actually say these things is a testament to the fact that the world has come a long ways from the days of the czars and the kings and the queens. You'd be put in prison for saying a fraction of the things that you just said. But I wonder why, why is it that freedom of speech is considered to be the domain of Western democracies? Freedom of, of speech, freedom of science, freedom of exploration existed in a non-democratic world not as well. Exist. Name me a country. Name me a country throughout history, human history, that had freedom of speech, freedom of science, freedom of religion. Name me that country. To a limited extent, you can't. a lot of them. You can't China, because there is Russia. none. Well, to a freedom, oh, yeah. of, freedom of I science. I don't think so. Include... If you if you disobey the emperor, off with your head. Again, challenging the democratic system could be also very detrimental. And I would like to get your opinion on the, this IT vigilantism that we have seen over the past uh, few years, uh, whistleblowers in the United States who blow the whistle on the American system because they believe that Which it's Which I think is a serving... good thing. I mean, the very fact that they can go out there rather than being assassinated is a testament to democracy. Isn't that also a case that democracies want to impose that point of view on everybody else? Because uh, What that, point that same... of view does a democracy want to impose on everybody else? Democratic way of governance. And we've seen a lot of uh, very well, bloody democracy wants to promote that. democracy. But democracy does not promote a religion. And while a religious group, a fundamentalist group, they want to impose their historical point of view on everybody else. And if you don't agree with it, you get your fingernails pulled but, out. Uh, Mr. Kaku, it's the same with democracies. And uh, American democracy, I think, is a prime example here. Because if you disagree with the American way of living a life, you, know, you, you, you face a very real danger of a war being pushed onto your country. Let so, me ask you a question, right? In Afghanistan, do they harbor terrorists who wanted to do damage to the United States? I don't know do that. Do nations? And who, I don't, I don't okay, let me ask you a question that. now. On tape, let me ask you a question. Absolutely. Who was behind 9-11? Are you a conspiracy theorist? Not Are really. Are you these people that think that maybe George W. Bush toppled his own building? What do you think is behind 9-11? Let me ask you that question. Who was behind 9-11? I think... Let me ask you a question. I heard who your question. Who was behind 
Mr. Kako, uh, I think... Ask, answer me a simple question. Who well, is behind 9-11? I give you the courtesy of being on your show. You should give me the courtesy of answering one simple question. Well, okay, Who I is think... Behind well, I, I, I do uh, tend to believe in this conventional narrative of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden being behind uh, that tragic and horrendous attack. But the question is whether the death of those people justified hundreds of thousands of people who were killed afterwards. And I don't think the goals that were set out before that war were actually achieved during that war. And that's the biggest problem. You've been very critical of radical groups uh, trying to impose that sort of uh, that point of view. And I totally agree with you. But I think the way and the means that democracies employ are not much better. I disagree. If you equate barbarism and religious fundamentalism with the principles of democracy, I think we've lost, if we accept your point of view, that there's some kind of moral equivalence between forces of darkness and ignorance and torture and persecution and the forces of democracy. I think we've lost. As far as I'm concerned, there are a lot of people who, uh, in this part of the world and many others, who truly believe in democratic ideals. And they're trying actually to, you know, uh, you know our countries are in transition. But uh, the problem that I see in many of the established Western democracies is that people have uh, grown used to taking those democratic uh, ideals and democratic freedoms for granted, and they no longer challenge their own authorities and no longer uh, subject their authorities to, you know, to the, all those tasks that are, have actually been uh, described in the writings of the uh, uh, American founding fathers. Everything you've said can be summarized in one sentence. You feel that American democracy is not perfect. I agree. I'm not going to defend imperfect decisions by an imperfect democracy for positions I don't agree with. I just believe in the principle, the fact that these things were hashed out in the press. I know because I was part of the debate. I know how vigorous the debate was in Congress, in churches. People were debating whether or not we should go to war in the Middle East. And I think that's a testament to the, the, the health of the, of the democratic process. And I think I have history on my side. But I'm not asking you about uh, electing a leader once every four years. Uh, it's not about that. Democracy is not just about going to the polls. I'm asking you... That's the bottom line. About... No, well, I don't think it it's about a line. It comes down to the vote. When everything is said and done, it comes down but to why, a vote. But why does it have to be once every four years? Because the Internet allows us, again, to have a vote on every single consequential issue. For example, the American president is considering arming the Syrian rebels. Why not to ask the American people whether they support that decision? The internet gives us that, After that right. After everything is said and done, you have to have rules, rules for the vote, representation of how many nations, how many people can vote for different kinds of candidates, and how long will they serve? If a president only serves for six months, you get chaos. If someone serves for 20 years, you get a dictatorship. You have to have a happy medium. The person should be given the benefit of the doubt that during that period of the time, they can carry out policies that people believe in. That's why we don't have government by the internet. Government by the internet would be chaos because every day a new poll is taken and of course people are fickle. That's a very interesting idea, but let's elaborate on that right after the break. Wealthy British scion Zach Wilson investment Markets, finance, scandal. Find out what's really happening to the global economy with Max Kaiser for a no holds barred look at the global financial headlines. Tune in to Kaiser Report on RT. Choose your language. Good morning for me, Kevin Owen. If you're any off, send us a message. Choose the news that concerns you. Choose the opinions that invigorate your mind. Choose the stories that impact your life. Choose the access to your RT.
science, technology, innovation, all the latest developments from around Russia. We've got the future covered. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing the pros and cons of scientific development with Michio Kaku, world-renowned physicist and popularizer of science. Now, before we went to the break, we were talking about um, the Internet and whether the Internet allows you um, any possibility for self-governance. And you, you don't believe that the Internet is actually the platform that could be used to uh, promote and maybe even expand and change the nature of what we call democracy? Democracy hopefully reflects the will of the people. The Internet represents a snapshot of the will of the people, depending upon who's haranguing, who's yelling, and who's screaming the most. That's a good thing, but we don't make policy on the basis of who yells the loudest and who can write the, the nicest slogan don't and think, who has really? the prettiest face. But on the Internet, all those things matter. And that's why I think you cannot have government by the Internet. Just like leafleting. Would you have government by leafleters? But I that, don't think uh, you, so, you can because argue leafleters that this is the represent way... the point of view of the leafleteer and the motions of the president. But this is the way uh, presidents are elected. This is a popularity context to, uh, contest to some extent. People appear on political ads. They try to spread their ideas. And if you look there's at the There's a difference. Data, and there's a difference. The internet is instantaneous. There's barrage of ideas coming at you all the time. A, a government by the internet would change every second. You don't like somebody, you vote them out. It would be madness, sheer madness to have, have a government by the internet. But I wonder why do we have to have those two extremes, you know, electing a president once every four or five years uh, and... Uh, well, name versus, me an alternative. Well, for example, an alternative would be, again, when you have major decisions about the future of your country or the future of somebody else's country, actually, for that matter, ask the people. It doesn't have to be every single step uh, that will be, uh, you know, decided by the Internet voters, but you can have those, uh, those polls once in a while when the decision is consequential. I disagree, because sometimes the popular decision is the incorrect one. Sometimes you have to have a leader that's not short-sighted, just sees the polls day by day, but has the long-term point of view. We remember our leaders who were visionary precisely because they ignored the day-to-day, hour-by-hour feelings of the people around them. Now, uh, let us go back to um, your own book. And I was fascinated by your ideas about type 0 and type 1 civilization, the transition from national mentality to a more globalized planetary thinking. And it could be argued that your own country, the United States, has made significant advances in that regard because English is a globalized language, your economy to a significant extent is a globalized economy. You know, the United States projects its uh, power, political and military around the world. Yet, it could also be argued that everything in the United States could be explained from the point of view of national interests, rather than doing that for the good of humanity. And I wonder how you would explain these paradox. Well, first of all, I'm not here to wave the flag of any particular nation. I'm a scientist. I try to view the future of civilizations by looking at outer space. When we look in outer space, civilizations far more advanced than us, we physicists rank them. Type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is a planetary civilization with a planetary culture, planetary energy. Type 2 would be like Star Trek, where we have a, several planets colonized by a stellar civilization that controls stars. Type 3 would be like Star Wars, the empire of an entire galaxy. Now, on this cosmic scale, what are we? We are type 0. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. Our planet is fractured, fractured by racial, historical, national boundaries. But in 100 years' time, according to the equations, we will be planetary. For example, we're seeing the beginning of a planetary language. English is number one, and Mandarin Chinese is number two on the Internet. We're seeing the beginning of a uh, type one economy with the beginning of the European Union, NAFTA, big, large trading blocks. And we're seeing the beginning of a type one culture, uh, soccer, um, the Olympics. We're seeing the beginning of a youth culture, rock and roll and rap music. Every time I look at the planet Earth, 
I see that we are now creating a planetary culture, a planetary economy, and a planetary civilization, but there are the forces of darkness. Now, who are those forces? I mean, who do you mean by those forces? People that would use violence to impose their minority point of view on the world at large, okay? And I think we could include with that broad definition, terrorists who say that, well, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm gonna put you in jail. If you don't believe me, I'll blow you up, okay? They don't, they don't, they fear the marketplace of ideas because they know they're gonna be outvoted. They know that they're not, their ideas are not popular. And so they simply want to impose these ideas by the force of law to have a central authority and go back to the 10th century rather than the 22nd century. Now, uh, many of the terrorists of the last couple of years were driven by religious ideologies. And I wonder what are your views on uh, religion in the type one civilization? Do you think uh, it will have a place there? I think we will have religion in the future because there's probably a gene for religion. You realize that if you have temporal lobe epilepsy of the brain, a blow to the side of the head, you can actually induce religious behavior. We can induce it, in fact, using electromagnetic stimulators to the brain. And so we do think that the brain is predisposed to be religious. It once had a purpose to keep tribes of bickering intelligent apes together millions of years ago. But now in the age of nuclear weapons, the age of the internet, it could become regressive. I think many scientists uh, tend to view the existence of God as a scientific question, but many of them try to uh, argue against uh, religion in the public domain, but sometimes you need to consider that from a social perspective as well, because it is one thing when people like yourself who live fairly intellectual life, and that in itself could be considered a luxury these days, because many people around the world live in very difficult conditions, and they don't have uh, the time and energy to ponder all those questions, but uh, given the inequality that exists in the world today, and given the violence that exists in the world today, um, do you feel like religion has its place in a sense of being not only this uh, temporal lobe damage, as you have pointed out, but simply you know, serving as, a, as the last hope for people who otherwise have uh, no consolation uh, seeing the world around them? Well, Einstein was asked the question, is there a God? And let me try to give you an answer. Einstein said there are two types of gods. We have to be very careful about this. The first is the god of Leibniz, the god of Spinoza, the god of harmony, beauty, elegance, simplicity. The universe is so gorgeous, it could not have been an accident. But we also have the personal god, the god that you pray to, the god that smites the Philistines, the god that slaughters your enemies, or the god of your salvation. Einstein did not believe in the second, but he did believe in the first. Then you ask another question, what about poverty? I travel around the world and I see rich countries and I see poor countries and I ask myself the simple question, why? Why are some countries poor? Why are some countries rich? What happened? Why do we have this disparity in wealth? And the reason is it has to go back to where wealth comes from, science and technology. In the, the 1400s, China turned inward. They burned their fleet. They ceased to send expeditions around the world. Scientists were persecuted and China stagnated. Same thing in the Muslim world. There was a debate in the Muslim world, where does truth come from? Does truth come from the Koran or does truth come from nature? Scientists said that truth comes from nature. Other people said, no, 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 God can change nature. God is above nature. Nature is a handcuff on God. Truth comes from the Koran, not nature. Well, we all know who won the debate. And that's one of the reasons why science in the, the Muslim world stagnated for about a thousand years. In some countries, science never happened, and that's why they're poor. You, you've spoken about that a lot, and I think it needs to be pointed out again and again that uh, such enthusiastic attitude to science all, all also has its downside. And you mentioned Einstein, and he was this uh, great pacifist and campaigned vigorously uh, during the uh, First World War against the war, but ultimately when you look at his own history, it was uh, Einstein's own research that ultimately paved the way for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Look at it this way. How come we're not speaking German today? How come there's not a swastika behind me? How come we don't persecute Russians and put them in incinerators right now? Because the Nazis were defeated. It took the blood and the sweat of millions of Russians and people around the world 
to break the back of Nazi Germany. It wasn't pleasant, okay? Mistakes were made at that time, but you realize that the effort was universal. But I think that my point was different. Obviously, I agree with you, but uh, you know That's that the why bombing... work was done on the atomic bomb, yeah, but to the... go up against Germany. It was used against Japan for reasons I disagree with, but it was built by scientists who did not want their relatives to be incinerated. And that's why we're not speaking German today. Absolutely, but I think that's the core of my question, that you know, scientists are doing the, 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 the job that they are doing for all the good reasons, but ultimately they cannot control how the result of their labor is being used. And you know better that's than I do that in. the bombing of that's Japan was totally senseless. That's why a democracy comes in. If there was a dictator in uh, our countries, you would have to work on their projects or you get tortured, okay? However, here's a situation where people volunteered to work on the A-bomb project. They thought they were going up against the Nazis. And if they, under, if they uncover new laws of physics, well, hey, it's not their responsibility for creating these laws of physics. Nature created these laws of physics. What we need is a way to control them. And that's where democracy comes in. I don't want to drag us into that previous discussion that we had before. But again, you say democracy gives us a check. And look at, the, at how it was used throughout history. Uh, in uh, 1945, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombed several hundred thousand people died. About 100,000. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, there are different estimates, but uh, obviously That's... a very large number of people died for no good strategic military reason. So you can argue that democracy failed on that account. Look, look at Iraq. Okay, the, look. Same, uh, the same thing. Hundreds of thousands are being Let killed. Let me say a few things. First, some of my relatives died in Hiroshima. Okay? Many Japanese trace their ancestry to Hiroshima. There was a large migration from Hiroshima to the United States as a consequence. Some of my relatives perished there. Do I hold a grudge? Look, war is not a simple tea party. It's messy. People make wrong decisions, but in their heart of hearts, they know that they have to do it because the opposite point of view would be total disaster. Given hindsight, we can always say, Sorry about that. I mean, shame on you. How could you work on the atomic bomb? But if the year is 1944, okay, and there's chaos erupting in the world with millions of people, not just 100,000, millions of people dying, okay, then you begin to realize it's more complex than a simple, well, hey, I told you so. It's much more complicated than that. I would have not dropped the atomic bomb, A, because my relatives were there, B, I think it was unnecessary. Japan was about to surrender. But given what was known at that time, I understand the opposite point of view. I don't agree with it, but I understand why the bomb was dropped. What I'm saying is whether, uh, I think democracies have to be much more disciplined in uh, the way they operate. Maybe scientific method could help as well. And looking back at the if history and analyzing the decisions 19, that were taken August before. In August 1945, if you were to have a vote of the American people about whether or not to drop the atomic bomb that cost $2 billion in 1945 dollars and would, quote, save the life of 100,000 Americans that are scheduled to invade Japan, I think, hands down, a democracy would have dropped the atomic bomb. I would not have, but a democracy would, given what I know about my own people. Michio Kaku, that's, it's been a great honor for me. Please join us again, same place, same time, here on Worlds Apart.